we are continuing with behavior strategies, talking about some of the things that we can do to help change behavior. And one of the things that we oftentimes start with is really deciding, is the problem a problem? So a lot of times kids will come in and they have this long list of all kinds of things that we would want to change and different behaviors. And, and so we can't oftentimes work on every single behavior all at the same time. So it's oftentimes good to kind of guide you know, whether or not it's actually a problem. So some things to think about, is it dangerous to the person doing it? Or is it dangerous to someone else or others in the immediate environment? So an example that I always give of this is kids that run. Like if you have someone that we call eloping or running, that can definitely be a dangerous behavior. If you have a kid that runs out of the school or runs into um, a parking lot or, or runs away when you're outside at recess, those kinds of things can be very dangerous. So we need to make sure that we have specific teaching strategies in place, not just, well, let's remember to hold their hand all the time, but it helps give us some guidance on, yes, this is a specific strategy and teaching procedure that we need to put in place for this child who is running. Another one is it is it dangerous to the environment or is it disruptive to the environment? There are sometimes uh, kids that are in the general education classroom and the level of disruption that can be tolerated in that classroom and not bother the other 25 kids is a lot less than what you can maybe tolerate in a special education classroom. So we certainly have to look at the disruption and how that's affecting the other kids. Uh, the other thing is, does it make the person appear deviant or valued different by the community? Or does it keep them from advancing to more independent opportunities? So another one of my stories, I had this student with Asperger's syndrome, which is that high functioning autism. And he was in middle school, first year middle school. And uh, he was having a couple of behaviors that were a concern, which is why they asked me to come in and help. And so one of them had to do with the fact that he loved geometry. This was his favorite thing, was very interested in geometry. He was always like in the hallways, you know, all the kids are talking and he's got his books out trying to do geometry. So they thought, hey, let's have him go to an eighth grade class working on geometry so that um, he could be challenged a little bit more. So at any rate, he goes to this class and one of the behaviors had to do with the fact that while the teacher was lecturing, he kind of felt like he was good and knew everything that he already needed to learn. So he decides in the beginning of the class or during that lecture part that he would use his pens and pencils to play Star Wars with sound effects. So he's in the front of the classroom going choo, 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 choo. And obviously that was disrupted to the classroom while she was trying to teach all these kids. And then another behavior, and if you work in special education, you're used to all of these kinds of things. He was picking his nose and it wasn't subtle, like he was going for the gold, right? So we had the student who we had to kind of decide what was going on. Now, some of these behaviors had been going on for a long time. Mom said he had issues with picking his nose for a long time. So I always try to tell people what guides us to come up with why we change one behavior over another or why we start with one. Again, we talked about things being dangerous. We need to start with those kinds of things right away. But another thing that I oftentimes help people with is to guide them to think about independence and employability. Even if we're talking about a little guy, it, at some point we need to make sure that they're gonna be independent and employable. And so I asked the team when we were talking about this particular student, what do you think he's gonna do? You know, I mean, he's in middle school, high school. Mom says, you know what? He's already uh, designing computer games and software and stuff at home on the computer. I definitely can see him doing something in that type of a field. I said, that sounds great. You know, let's figure out how we can teach him that it's not appropriate to pick your nose, but use a Kleenex and all of those kinds of things. But what if mom had said, you know what his favorite thing is? He comes home every day, he watches Rachel Ray, he can't wait to be a cook someday or a famous chef. Well, then we're gonna have issues with picking your nose, right? Not that they're not issues in both situations, but it might guide how I change the behavior in a little, little different ways. Now, one of the things that we talked about again, does it make them look different socially? he did not fit in. No one wanted to sit by him at lunch. So those are all things that kind of guide us to figure out what behaviors do we change? Which ones do we work on first and which ones are the most important? 
The other thing that we really need to look at prior to coming up with behavior interventions is looking at prevention. Like how do we prevent the behavior from occurring in the first place? And there's a number of things we can look at that really help us kind of figure out how to do that. We want to make sure the kids and the individuals all know the rules and expectations. We want to make sure that they understand those things. We're going to be talking some in some of these videos about visual supports and different things that we can do to make things very predictable for kids. How much they have to do, what are the rules. We can do different things to kind of make those visual and help kids to understand those expectations. And the other thing is we do have to have those high expectations for kids. We want them to be able to uh, do all that they can do and those high expectations can be very beneficial for kids to be successful. The other thing is we want to apply reinforcement and consequences consistently. We have to make sure that we follow things in a very consistent way. So if you have a rule that the child can be on the computer for 10 minutes and when that timer goes off, they have to stop and get back to work, you have to be consistent with that. You can't let behavior say, okay, fine, you can have 10 more minutes because you don't want to deal with the behavior because then that just reinforces it. We have to be really, really consistent that if we put particular strategies in place that we follow them and that everybody on the team follows them. The other one is we want to take make changes in the teaching environment and the curriculum and, and all of those kinds of things. Again, this is prevention. We're trying to prevent behavior before it happens. So if I have kids that I know have a lot of trouble with writing, then what are some things I can do to prevent that behavior in the first place? Can I shorten the writing task? Can I give them a way to uh, maybe use stamps on a piece of paper or type? There's different things that we can do to try to increase the likelihood of good behavior if we can make those changes to the curriculum ahead of time. If you have a student that doesn't like math, I mean, they like it okay, but math is not their favorite subject, and you give them a worksheet that has like 50 problems on it, I have known some kids that aren't even going to see what the problems are and they're already going to have behaviors because it's too much. But if I could take that worksheet and maybe just give them the first 10, so I'm changing that curriculum ahead of time, I might be able to prevent some of those behaviors from happening in the first place. The other one is we want to break the chain of inappropriate behavior. So if we start to see some of those things happening, that we can stop that behavior before it gets to the point where it's more of a concern. And then another one that I always like to talk about a little bit is engaging kids in age appropriate, meaningful and functional tasks. And I think this is a really important piece because even a person with a developmental disability wants to feel like they're doing something meaningful. So this is another example that I had. When I first started uh, working with people with developmental disabilities, I was still taking classes. I was in college at uh, MSU and uh, I went home for the summer and oftentimes worked in what was called an ISL, Independent Supported Living. So they were people with developmental disabilities that needed care and support part of the time. They were not 24 hour, it was mostly you know, after they came home from work and helping them to maybe get some groceries or make sure they take their medicine and some of those kinds of things. And I had seven different adults on my caseload. They all lived in different places. They weren't like, like two were roommates in an apartment and, and that kind of thing. There was one couple that was married. And so I worked with all of them, but all of them also worked at some a place called a sheltered workshop. If you're familiar with a sheltered workshop, it's oftentimes a place where people with developmental disabilities can work and they do a lot of piecemeal kind of work where they're maybe doing some assembling or packaging and some of those kinds of things. And they all worked at this particular sheltered workshop. Well, one of the weeks that I was there, every single day of the week, as it got to Tuesdays, it got to Wednesday, they were crabby, more behavior. Uh, one of the ladies would, you know, start complaining about things. One of the other guys would, you know, just get mad easily. And I'm like, you know, the gosh, this is really strange how everybody, and they don't all live in the same apartment or anything. They're all kind of having some behavior that just seemed to get worse. And by Friday, Edna, one of the ladies, she's like, I hate that son of a, uh, workshop. I'm not going back to that stupid place. And so I, I just had this feeling. I'm like, I wonder if something happened at work because they were all at the sheltered workshop for work. Maybe something was going on there that was really concerning. And that's what was causing this particular difficult day for almost all of the consumers and individuals. 
So on Monday, I went in and I went to the sheltered workshop and I said, hey, I just wanted to know if anything unusual happened last week. And you know, if there was anything that you noticed, some of the some of the clients were kind of frustrated about some things, and I was just curious what was going on. And he was like, "Well, we did have some concerns, but we we made it work out." And I was like, "Oh, what's going on?" Well, typically, a sheltered workshop will contract with actual agencies. Like they're actually working with an agency that needs to do some of this assembly work and they're willing for the sheltered workshop to take that work and let the people with developmental disabilities do it. And so oftentimes a, a, a shelter workshop will have different organizations that they work with. And I knew one of the ones that they had had a long-term relationship with was a company that puts the little toys inside the plastic containers that you would <clears throat> that you would have in a, a grocery store where you know you put a quarter in and the container comes out and there's like a little ring in it or something you you know what I'm talking about so they were assembling those that was one of the jobs and so the lady I was talking to at the sheltered workshop she says well we lost a lot of contracts last week and we really didn't have much work for them to do we only had the work for them to fill those little plastic containers she's like but we totally figured it out to keep them busy on Monday they had to fill them all up on Tuesday we had them take them all apart on Wednesday they had to fill them all up Thursday they took them all apart and then on Friday they filled them all up and then we were able to ship them to the company and I thought oh my gosh how could you do that to these individuals they knew that they were not doing meaningful work that they were just doing busy work and this is something that has always been really important to me I took that when I took when I started teaching in a classroom that when I have kids do things I don't want them to have to undo everything so maybe for my classroom of kids with autism that had more uh, significant behavior and we're in like a self-contained classroom. I might be working on an activity. I remember one of the things we were working on was like assembling plastic silverware and a napkin. So it had it's something called a jig where it's got like almost looks like a placemat where each one of those things are kind of outlined with a black marker and you're supposed to match the fork and the plastic spoon and the knife and the napkin and then you pick them all up and put them in a baggie and you're doing like this assembly task. And so I always told my kids, we're doing this for sack lunch day and we went and delivered them to the cafeteria. They weren't really for sack lunch day, but I still delivered them and then laid Later I went and, and picked them up and took them apart for them to do it on another day. I just think it's really important that kids do things that are meaningful, that are functional. Okay. Another one is teach choice making skills and then honor the skills made by those choices and those individuals. So we want to make sure that a lot of times with our kids, you know, we're telling them what to do and, and how to do it and we're giving them a lot of directions and, and really giving kids choices can help them with their independence and even with compliance. And so we say to kids, okay, are you ready to do math? And they say, no. And then you say, okay, it's okay, I'll help you. And then they say, heck no, in the form of behavior because you didn't listen to them the first time. So we wanna make sure when things are not a choice, we, we, we let them know that. Like we might say based on the schedule, oh, it's time for math, but can we incorporate choice? Could we say to the child, it's time for math, would you like to take a clipboard and sit in a beanbag and do it, or do you want to stay at your desk? Or it's time to do our art project. Do you want to use the colored pencils or the markers? So any time we can give choices can be very helpful. This is something that I also learned when I was uh, working with my own children was something called love and logic. You may be familiar with it, but kids kind of go through this period where they're refusing to wear a coat when it's way too cold outside and you get into this power struggle. The idea is, oh, it's time to go. You want to carry it or wear it? And you give the child a choice. They feel like they have some control. Pretty much most of the time, if it's cold enough, they're going to put the coat on. And so it's that kind of thing, like really giving kids choices to where they feel like they have more control and that increases some of the compliance. Another one that's a preventative strategy is reducing the amount of downtime. So making sure that kids don't have too much downtime. I think that sometimes when kids have too much free time and downtime, that just invites more problems, especially with our kids. Like again, it might be a student with autism or developmental disability that doesn't have a lot of leisure skills. What I mean by that is like play skills and that kind of thing. You know, they don't know what to do with themselves when it's time to have downtime. And so that tends to invite more opportunities for problem behavior. We want to structure the environment. 
I remember when I had my students' uh, classroom of kids with autism. You know how it is, the week before Christmas break uh, or holiday break, everybody is doing like crossword puzzles and movies from the book they just read and all these kinds of things because we're, we're trying to incorporate some, some things about the holidays going along with the curriculum. And my students with autism could not handle that. Like they needed their schedule and they needed it to be structured and they needed it to be the same and they still needed to go to math. And so I had to really keep that environment very structured for them to be successful. And then we also want to identify and use effective reinforcers. That's going to be an important piece is that we want to reinforce good behavior. So again, like if we have the little girl that is screaming because she doesn't know how to use language and she's screaming in the kitchen and mom says, here, you can have some uh, Cheez-Its. Well, we want to teach her that she can ask. Maybe she's going to sign or use a card or something so she can use her words. We have to make sure that we reinforce that. We have to reinforce her by saying, great job using your words. Yes, here's a snack so that we can make sure that we increase that behavior. So a primary deficit of why this behavior occurs, and we've talked about this a little bit when we talked about functional assessment, is that one of the primary deficits that cause children to use disruptive behavior to get or avoid something is that deficit in communication. If they don't have the communication skills, the little girl doesn't have the communication skills to say, hey mom, we ate lunch at 11 o'clock and I'm hungry now, then that behavior is going to be more likely to happen. I had this little guy, he was also a middle school student, and he, his name was, I'll just say Joey. I use Joey a lot for names. And so Joey had a really rough day one particular day. Now he had pretty decent language, but I recognized as a person with autism, it was very repetitive. It's something that we call echolalic language where they just repeat what they've heard. And so we would walk by a classroom and if he saw the United States flag, we had to stop and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, he would he would recite long periods of Disney movies exactly the way they are, uh, they're, they're said in the movie with the tone and inflection. It was amazing. He could memorize all these things. And so it seemed like he was talking a lot. But I noticed again that a lot of it was just this repetitive language because he wasn't using functional language. He wasn't communicating functionally. Like for example, I have to go to the bathroom or I'm hungry right now. Well, this was in the spring. I had been working with him to try to teach him some language, but one particular day, he just had a really bad day. And he was having some problems with um, be being frustrated over demands. And he would bite his hand and try to pull my hair and different things like that. He would get very frustrated. And we were trying to figure out, you know, why is he having such a bad day? It didn't seem like anything was triggering it other than he would just like get mad all of a sudden. And uh, there was a time he picked up a can of uh, soup and threw it at my paraprofessional and hit her in the head and we're like oh this is just such a tough day for him well at the end of the day we're walking to the bus I remember that it was in the spring because he was wearing a brand new pair of sandals and we're walking to the bus and he lifts up his foot and he says ouch so I look down on his foot and again they were a brand new pair of sandals mom accidentally left the little plastic tag the little plastic piece that holds a tag on the sandals and so all day that was pushing into his foot, causing a blister. And by the end of the day, the blister had broken open. And so every time he took a step, that hard piece of plastic was pushing into an open blister. He did not have the communication skills to say, hey, my foot hurts, can you help me with this? So he communicated that through behavior. So we recognize again that kids have problem behavior oftentimes because of that deficit in communication. So these deficits are oftentimes seen in children with autism, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, language disorders, things like Down syndrome. And so that's gonna be a big area when we're looking at teaching new behavior is teaching kids how to communicate. Now we also see behavior sometimes because of emotional regulation deficits. And this is where kids will oftentimes have difficulty because they don't tolerate frustration well. They don't problem solve. They're not very flexible. And those kinds of things we can see because of these emotional dysregulations. The reason that I like to explain the emotional regulations in that way and, and kind of help you understand is when we talk about two-year-olds. So all two-year-olds have these little terrible two tantrums. And some parents will say, well, three was even worse, whatever. That age group between two and three, they have tantrums. It's part of development. We all see that that's exactly what happens at that age. But part of that is not necessarily because they're constantly wanting to get what they want, but because of these skill deficits, like not being able to tolerate frustration, not doing well when someone tells them no, or being flexible, or again, having those communication skills. 
some of our kids that we're seeing in special education or even in regular education that are having some of these problem behaviors are like that two-year-old because developmentally their emotional regulation is still at the two-year-old level. So it's the terrible two tantrums that we all say, oh, isn't that cute when they're two, that's still happening in a nine-year-old body or a 10-year-old body. And so then it doesn't look so cute and we kind of think, what's wrong with that kid? Why isn't he behaving correctly? When actually it's part of that skill deficit in that he's not able to regulate very well. So again, we see this in that terrible twos, those two and three year olds that have the tantrums and they don't regulate very well and they don't have very good social skills and those kinds of things cause them to have some of these behaviors. So kids develop the communication skills but have not developed in these other areas when they're, when they're having difficulty with the regulation. So again, they might have trouble with social skills, emotional regulation. We're gonna be talking about something called executive function skill deficits and that can also be a factor. Problem solving and then frustration tolerance. We have kids that when you tell them no, they don't tolerate that very well when they're two. And so if they're still having difficulty with frustration tolerance, sometimes they're not tolerating that very well when they're nine or 12 either. So who are these kids? These kids that have the emotional regulation, we sometimes see um, they have these significant delays in social skills and executive function skills. So we might see this in a student with Asperger's syndrome or high functioning autism. So again, we talked about how some kids have behavior because of a communication deficit. They can't communicate that I'm hungry. They can't communicate that something hurts. What about our kids that have communication skills but are still having behavior? Again, that's the emotional regulation. So kids with Asperger's syndrome typically have very good uh, communication skills, but they don't regulate their emotions very well. We might also see this with emotional disorders. So we might see this with kids that have bipolar or mood disorders. Also kids with ADHD sometimes have a difficult time regulating emotions. And then other emotional disorders like uh, oppositional defiant disorder, reactive attachment disorder, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, all of those kinds of things can be seen with a number of these kids as well. And oftentimes that difficulty with emotional regulation is apparent. So what happens? Like we have kids that are two and they have this behavior when they're two and they have these little tantrums. How do they go from a kid having these tantrums at age two to somebody that's, you know, like a third grader that's having appropriate behavior in school? There's a couple of things that happen. As language skills increase, behavior gets better. As social skills increase, behavior gets better. Kids start to regulate better. We start to see better behavior. But it's very important to understand that these things only happen as long as positive reinforcement is not in place. There's a video that I've seen on YouTube. It's great, you should watch it. I, we're gonna put a link on the website. It's this little guy in footy pajamas and he's about two years old. And so the video shows like, you can tell like mom or dad is videoing the, the little guy and he's on the floor and he's kicking and he's screaming and he's having his little terrible two tantrum. Well, mom then takes the camera and she still like has it on the child, but you can tell like she's moving into another room and kind of backs up into this room so that it's clear that now the little boy cannot see mom. So you hear complete silence. Then all of a sudden the little boy comes into the, the view of the camera and then drops down and has a tantrum. And then she does it again where she goes in another room. He's quiet. He comes in and he drops down and he has a tantrum, right? So he needs an audience. I, I'm not having a tantrum unless mom is right here and uh, I can tell her what I'm trying to tell her through communicating through behavior. So an example that I give based on that video, like let's say he saw a bag of Skittles on the kitchen counter and he said, can I have some candy? You know, he communicated in some way that he wanted some candy and mom's answer was no, we're getting ready to have dinner. Well, he's having this little terrible two tantrum, following mom around, doesn't tolerate frustration, doesn't like being told no. So what would happen, however, if after maybe 10 or 15 minutes of this little guy having a terrible two meltdown tantrum, mom says, okay, you can have just one. What's that gonna do? That's gonna reinforce that behavior. So even though some of it is the skill deficit, I don't like being told no and I don't tolerate that frustration very well because I'm only two. If we reinforce it by saying, fine, you can have a Skittle, then we're also strengthening that behavior. We're making it more, we're making it stronger as well. So we have to look at both of those things. 
if we don't reinforce it, if we don't give the kid the skittle and stick to our no, and we're very consistent in our expectations, kids will develop language, social skills, and frustration tolerance, and they will develop the skills that they need to be very successful in school. So we have to make sure that we don't reinforce those behaviors.